Next, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Sue Washer, President and CEO of AGTC. He's going to give us a brief overview of the pipeline, and then we'll have some time for some Q&A. Thank you, Steve. So this is our safe harbor statement, and then these are some company highlights. We are a company with deep expertise in the AAV gene therapy space. We've been in this business for 15 years, so we've seen a lot of development of the technology, the components. Uh, we have to gathered together an extensive amount of IP. We have a very broad pipeline that Steve and I are going to spend some time talking about, and we have a key partnership with Biogen on two of our programs. So this is our pipeline slide, and we are going to walk through a discussion of these um, programs. But I think one of the things I want to say off the top is all of our programs in ophthalmology are orphan programs that have substantial patient populations, 20, 30, 40,000 patients apiece. Uh, also, two of them are partnered with Biogen, and two of them have remained wholly owned. Uh, three of these programs are already in the clinic. Uh, the fourth one will be filing an IND this year, and then we have a fifth program that's going to be going into the clinic in, in the first half of 2018. So a broad number of projects going forward. Uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the platform, and this is an area where we really do feel that our 15 years of experience and the combined probably 100 years of experience of our scientific founders uh, really give us an advantage, an understanding that gene therapy is complex, but if you think very carefully about the technology and the component parts, such as the capsid, the promoter, the gene expression cassette, Formulation, which I don't think many of us spend enough time thinking about, uh, manufacturing and physical delivery, it's being able to put all these components together that becomes really important. And it becomes important on an indication by indication basis. So flipping back to the pipeline, you can see that in XLRS, physical delivery was the most important because it's a structural protein that's missing, the eye is fragile, we had to do intravitreal injection. We were not going to attempt subretinal, and we bu built the whole entire product around that key component. And it's just one more example in achromatopsia, we built that program around the promoters uh, because it's a channel protein that's mutated in this indication, and that means that we didn't want that channel being opened in other cell types. So we wanted a promoter that only expressed the protein in the specific cell um, to make sure that we were uh, being as safe as possible. So it's those kinds of understandings of the details of the technology, being able to pull them together for each clinical phenotype that we feel is our core advantage. Thanks. Thanks, Sue. Uh, maybe starting first with the XLRS program, uh, maybe just briefly walk us through the approach and, and the body of uh, supportive data that, that uh, you've accumulated for the program. Yeah, so we've been working on XLRS for a number of years. It was actually funded, the originating work was funded by the Foundation Fighting Blindness, a patient advocacy organization we have a really good relationship with. Uh, we worked in the animal model of the disease, which happens to be a mouse model. Uh, but then, as is true for all of our programs, we tied that to work in the primates, because what we've found is that serotypes and promoters don't act the same in primates as they do in the lower mammals. So when you're thinking about targeting in gene therapy and specific expression in cell types, you really have to work in non-human primates. So those are the two sets of data that we took in XLRS uh, moving into the clinic. The other thing we thought was advantageous in XLRS is that it was a fairly large patient population, and it's a protein that is secreted out of the cells into the extracellular matrix and holds the layers of the retina together. Um, and so there was seemed to be an advantage in there that we really didn't care. We could use a really strong, ubiquitous promoter to get lots of protein being produced and secreted into that matrix. So you've enrolled the low dose, the mid dose, and a couple patients in the high dose uh, and promised to release data mid-year. What are the endpoints that you're going to be looking at? Yeah, so we are standing by that guidance of uh, mid-year release, uh, release of the full dose escalation study, which are those three doses, and it'll be a total of 12 patients. And what we're going to be looking at is a series of uh, endpoints. Uh, we are measuring all four approvable endpoints in ophthalmology, which are um, 
color vision, contrast sensitivity, visual acuity, and visual fields. Um, but for this indication, we think the two most important endpoints are visual acuity and visual fields. Uh, because it's a structural protein that's missing, the, the delamination that causes the vision loss can happen either in the central vision, which was, would affect visual acuity, or it can happen in the periphery, which will affect visual fields. So those are two important endpoints. But we're also measuring some surrogate endpoints because we want to get that supportive kind of functional information. So we're measuring ERGs, electroretinograms, to look at are we improving the electrical function of the eye. And we're also looking at OCTs, which is kind of like a sonogram, non-invasive sonogram of the structure of the eye. So we'll be able to see whether those layers of the retina have really come back to together. And maybe talk about what you've seen so far in the low dose and the mid dose, maybe in terms of safety and any preliminary signs of efficacy. Right. So we have stated publicly uh, uh, to date that we have seen a good safety profile. The product's well tolerated. Uh, We have seen mild to moderate inflammation in the majority of patients that either resolves spontaneously or resolves after treatment with steroids. Um, so we feel uh, that, that um, good about that going forward. Uh, we haven't given any uh, guidance on efficacy endpoints except to say that in the low dose, uh, we have not seen significant, uh, clinically significant improvements in, in efficacy endpoints. Great. We'll stay tuned in, uh, for the next couple of months. Uh, Moving on to the achromatopsia programs, uh, CNGA3 and B3, Uh, maybe just give us the same rundown that you just did for XLRS, the disease pathology, the vector and the approach, and uh, the data. So these are two indications that we're really excited about because they're wholly owned by us, so that they're they're kind of our in-house programs. Also, they happen to be programs where there are really good animal models. Uh, There are two uh, animal models that are naturally naturally occurring. For the B3, it's a dog model. For the A3, it's a sheep model. So there are substantial animals with eyes about the same size, not too much smaller than humans. And because they're naturally occurring, we feel the genetic background and the phenotypic background is very, very similar to patients. And so we were able to screen through promoters capsids and delivery methods in these very robust animal models um, doing uh, very fine dose ranging and being able with the larger animals to get a read on, well, yes, dogs and sheep don't read eye charts, but you can take them through obstacle course mazes and see their improvement in their visual acuity as well as improvement in their um, uh, light sensitivity. Because achromatopsia is a disease, I mentioned earlier that there's a missing channel protein in the cone photoreceptors. And what that means is that when the photon of light enters the eye, it just bounces off the cone. It doesn't enter the cone and trip the phototransduction cascade to generate the electrical signal that your brain recognizes as vision. So these patients have absolutely no cone vision, um, which means that they are, uh, right now, if if a, a chromatopsia patient was sitting where I'm sitting, they'd be completely blind because of these lights. Um, And they wear very heavy glasses, uh, dark goggles, even in, um, uh, you know, a a regular office building. They also uh, are all legally blind uh, because they only have rod vision, and our rods uh, are not very good um, at uh, visual acuity. Uh, And finally, they see no color. Uh, It's not excellent color blindness that they can see some color, not other color. They are completely no color, only black and white and shades of gray. But all the patients, you know, that you talk to, they will say they don't care about the color vision. They care about being legally blind and light sensitive. So there's a couple different, I guess, unmet needs, so to speak, in achromatopsia. Maybe uh, what are the endpoints you're looking at in this study, and maybe what do you think would be most impactful for patients? Right, so that you know, there's unmet needs in all these indications because there's no um, treatments for any of the indications that we're working on. In achromatopsia, it's really kind of this twofold thing in that they have poor visual acuity. Uh, so you would want to try and improve their visual acuity so they can get around their environment, recognize faces, recognize objects, etc. 
But also what is really very debilitating that I commented on is this light sensitivity. And in fact, the patients will report to you that that's the single biggest thing that affects their day-to-day -day living. Uh, because even, you know, as children especially, the parents talk about this a lot, that the kids can't go outside in the playground and play with other kids during the day. Uh, they ha if they do, they wear two sets of heavy goggles, they still can't see very well. They're really most comfortable playing at night. Uh, which is when their friends, moms, are telling them it's time to go to bed. So it's, and then the adults, they actually, you'll see on the blogs that they, they pick places to live. They love a lot, there's a, a lot of patients that recommend living in Seattle for probably obvious reasons. Um, and they pick places where there's good public transportation. There's a lot of chit chat about reliability of, of public service and public transit. Um, so it's really that light sensitivity that affects the, uh, the quality of life. And is the cone architecture still well preserved in these diseases? So there are significant numbers of cones uh, that are still viable. And we know this because we've worked with uh, just a brilliant researcher at the University of Wisconsin who adapted the techniques of the Hubble telescope to be able to look through uh, with, from a standard fundus exam, look through the vitreous to the back of the eye and actually be able to visualize cones. And he can see cones and he can tell whether they have their inner and outer segments intact. Um, and what happens in all of us, our outer segments turn over because that's how we refresh from the phototransduction cascade. And so many of these patients' cones do have that architecture maintained. Got it. And we heard earlier today from Sympromix and 4D and, and some other exciting companies. You, you guys have a lot of partnerships mm -hmm. with, uh, with both of those and Bionic Site at Biogen. Uh, maybe just give us a snapshot of, of these next-gen uh, technologies and partnerships and maybe what do they uh, enable uh, you to do that you can't do uh, today? So we talked about the platform and the fact that gene therapy is complex and has these many components. And you have to design these components, each one of them specifically, indication by indication. Well, we're pretty agnostic as to where that technology comes. We don't have to invent it in-house. We just want to put together the best product. And so that's why we've made the partnership with Sympromix and 4D. That's why we're partnered with Bionic Site and Optogenetics, because they have the best gene cassette, we feel, for that um, uh, indication, as well as a very unique uh, device add-on. Um, and so those... Uh, kinds of partnerships allow us to be maintained on the cutting edge and really continue to carefully design products for the future. Any questions from the audience? Uh, maybe last program, uh, give us a snapshot of the XLRP program and what the, uh, what the approach is here and, and which gene you're targeting. So like the XLRS program, the XLRP program is partnered with Biogen, who's been a really great collaborator to work with uh, as and moving forward on these projects. And we had that um, partnership. It's a billion dollars in BioBucks, for, so it's a very important partnership. Um, XLRP um, is another patient population that's about 20,000 uh, patients. It is a single gene defect. It's the RPGR gene. Uh, again, what attracted us to, to this indications was the patient population size and the fact that there's a dog model. So there's a naturally occurring dog model of the disease. So we were again able to work through, uh, you know, correction of phenotype, kinds of endpoint improvements in that, that very robust dog model. And it, but we still did the targeting work in non-human primates. And in this, in, in this case, we picked a completely different uh, promoter because we needed to transduce both rods and cones. Um, and so again, an evidence of really specifically designing uh, for each indication. And that uh, IND we're going to be filing this year. Um, and then the bionic site IND, the optogenetics program, will be filing in 2018. Great. Thanks, Sue. And we will be looking for the data and following all the progress. Great. Thanks, Steve. Thank you.